But if industry needs 50% of the market, you know, a decade ago and now 60% moving to 70, if we see the industrial demand continue, and I'm not talking just photovoltaics, so that's a great part of it, but also EVs and everything else that we use to electrify the planet, we will see, in theory, industry alone will not have enough silver to meet demand at current mining levels and recycling levels. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marquez here with you for Arcadia Economics. And today I'm quite excited to have back one of my favorite guests who I'm guessing most people watching today's show are very familiar with because, of course, joined by David Morgan, the silver guru of the MorganReport.com, who is one of the people studying the silver market for the longest, quite well known in the industry. And Certainly with a lot happening in the last couple of weeks, we've seen silver get to the higher end of its range and pull up a chart in just a second when we get started. But most importantly, David, it's great to see you again, as always. And how are you today, sir? Well, Chris, I'm doing well today. We've got some sunshine here in the great Northwest, and it's always a pleasure to see you. So I'm ready. <laughs> Well, it's a great time to have you in, obviously, as you and probably most of the people watching this are quite familiar. We've had a rally over the past three weeks now. Uh, and we've seen gold hit new all-time highs. Saw silver start off a little bit slowly, although here we see uh, it was back down at $22 on, let's call that February 12th, almost $3 <laughs> higher now. Curious, uh, any of your thoughts as we've seen silver finally catch up, actually on a percentage basis, uh, silver up about 13.5% in the past month, almost double the increase in the gold price. I guess gold gets more attention since you had the new all-time high and silver is still well below its all-time high. But perhaps we could start there and just get any of your thoughts from what you've seen in the past couple of weeks. Yeah, I can only add on really that, you know, it's been frustrating. I mean, with gold leading the way, that's fine. I have no issue with that. But I am, um, and I am happy to see silver, you know, outperform on a percentage basis you just outlined. I really want to see some sustainability in silver. And there's this, you know, the Dow theory is like the transports and utilities confirm the industrial. And Jim Dines came up with that years ago that, you know, you had to have confirmation with silver confirming gold or vice versa. And I kind of buy into that. And so what does that mean? It means that both of them are, are rallying, you know, not exactly the same or exactly the same time, but more or less confir confirming each other. And for that confirmation to exist, and this is just an arbitrary number that I've picked out studying the silver market for the decades that I have, I put that, I'd put it at a gold silver ratio. And I'd say that the gold silver ratio has to be 70 or lower for that confirmation to occur. And it's not there yet, although silver is catching up. So, you know, I need to see, I'd like to see silver above 28 and sustain it. And I'm a little bit, um, I would say concerned, but perplexed that the dynamics and fundamentals of silver are probably stronger than gold on a fundamental basis. And yet it obviously hasn't kept pace, although it's catching up. So probably a long answer, but those are my thoughts. Well, that makes sense. And as you mentioned there, on a fundamental basis, ties in with something that I've been thinking about that we talked a minute about before we hit record. Yet that bridge between supply and demand and the price, because as we've seen, let's say the Fed goes to 0% rates tomorrow and starts QE again. Now, on one hand, you would certainly think on the COMEX pricing, which is following and dictated a lot by the Fed, that you would see a rally in silver. Although I've been trying to find where and how things are actually connected with what underlies that, where we have Silver Institute right now has us in a deficit for, I believe, the third or fourth straight year, projecting that going forward. So you could say that Right now, the supply is not meeting the demand. So at a higher price, you get more supply. And perhaps if we are indeed in a deficit and we see that continue, I'm not saying that we're going to get something that happened uh, similar to the cocoa market, but 
at least some of the pieces seem to be in play there. Although, let's say they, the underlying supply and demand doesn't change, but you just see the price of silver go up. On some level, there has to be the actual demand, because if we got $75 silver tomorrow, yet if there's not monetary demand, whether inside or outside of the U.S., maybe this wouldn't, this would take a couple of years, but if, let's say, silver stayed at $75, then eventually you get more supply coming online. So I guess through all of that, what what does it take to get an environment where we see a higher silver price, but not a short squeeze that shoots up and comes back down? And even as these monetary events play out, what does it take to get something that is sustained? Yeah, well, there's a lot to unpack there. So let me start with this. Uh, there was a, I, I think the best way to say if there's a deficit or not is to look at the above ground silver supply. And if that's shrinking, you have a deficit. If it's expanding, you really couldn't say you have a deficit. You could say there is a deficit based on <clears throat> accounting. You know, there's this much that has to go to uh, industrial, this much that goes into investment, and there's a you know delta that's a negative number. You could say that. But let's go back to the very basics. We'll just say rudimentary. I don't know anything other than what I can visually see and what the facts are. So if you go from 19... 90 to 2005, there was a deficit for 15 consecutive years of 100 million ounces of silver a year. So it went from about stock probably about 2 billion ounces above ground in 1990 down to 500 million in 2005. And yet the price was at like eight bucks. So you would have thought 15 years of consecutive deficit. If that happened in wheat or soybean oil or cocoa or oil i mean you would have seen a higher price but not in silver why well there's lots of reasons why you can read my book silver manifesto and look at the the sharps law and the ratios and all the stuff we did mathematically to prove <clears throat> that the silver market is managed i'll use that word so regardless at some point had that continued i mean in theory you would have been out of silver had that 100 million ounces continued another five years it didn't the silver supply started to build after 2005, but the mining supply started to come on board in the early 2000s, and we started to build up the above ground supply. So there is a lead lag. So let's so that's that's the supply demand, and the numbers don't seem to add up. Let's go back to 1980 and talk about the silver squeeze. So if we go back to the silver squeeze in 1980, if you look at January 1979. The all-time high for silver in U.S. dollars was about $6 per ounce. A year later, it had gone up 850%. In one year, silver went up 850%. It went from $6 to $50 plus. Now, it was a one-day event, but nonetheless, it's a fact it got there. So what happened after that? Well, here's the interesting thing, that after the squeeze, the market came back and settled down and we're Silver Thursday in March and all these things that, you know, silver nuts are familiar with. One thing that hardly anyone ever talks about is what did the silver price look like after that? And the answer is the average price for silver for the entire year of 1980 was $20 an ounce. So let's think about that for just a minute. And let me emphasize my point. January 79, $6, all time high. 1980, three times six is 18. So two bucks more than that, $20 silver for the entire year. So I would say hey, what we might see is something similar to that the next time. You might get a monetary demand that takes silver all the way up to pick your favorite number, 100, 150, 200. I don't know. I'm not going for the thousand. Sorry, Chris, I just can't do that. But, you know, I can go for 100. I go 150, maybe 200. I don't know. But we get a spike. And then we get a resettlement. Well, the all-time high in nominal terms, as we all know, is 50. So let's say that it shoots up to 150 for talking purposes and it settles back down at, oh, let's pick 75, for example. So that's well above the nominal high that it's been for decades, right? And it averages 75 for the entire year. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I just, you know, I know the silver market. Don't know everything, never said I did. And, you know, I'm probably losing my status as a silver guru, which was 
kind of a joke to begin with. But regardless, I see it that way. Now, who says that? Week, You're still the silver guru, David. Come <laughs> yeah, on, so, man. Anyway, let's look at the other side. And you asserted, or how I heard it, that, you know, if we get to $75 silver, that's going to bring on more supply and you're going to have inventory build and that's going to take the price down. In in the most commodities, that's true. And silver, I'm not so sure because if and only if the projections going forward by such notables as Matt Watson are correct, we are in what Jim Dines would call a natural corner. So the hunts tried to corner the silver market. You could say yes, you could say no, and make up your own mind on that. But if industry needs 50% of the market, you know, a decade ago and now 60% moving to 70, if we see the industrial demand continue, and I'm not talking just photovoltaics, so that's a great part of it, but also EVs and everything else that we use to electrify um, the, the planet, we will see, in theory, industry alone will not have enough silver to meet demand at current mining levels and recycling levels. And we may have hit peak silver. Now, here's where I have to be really careful. Because if you read, uh, and I know you bought the book, you know, Silver Profits in the 80s, there were silver profits in the 70s, what's behind the new boom in silver, coming currency crisis. I mean, Jerome Smith wrote a lot of books. But he projected like $200 silver in the mid-90s or something. Remember that. And I was at a conference. I've said this before, so people can fast forward this. They've heard it before. But I was at a, one of my first conferences, like the second time I spoke in public. And I'm at this wealth protection conference in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, or Tempe, I think. And got through my pitch. And the uh, the proprietor, the one that put the event together, goes, let me tell you this. He got kind of huffy with me. He said, oh, we've been hearing about this supply demand thing about something. And, 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 you know, it never happened. You know, it gets wrong. You know, what happened, you know? I said, well, here's what happened. I go, Jerome Smith made the assumption that the 50 or 60 years of silver mining was 350 million ounces per year. And it was that way for 60 years consecutively. So he drew the conclusion that it was going to remain at 350 million ounces a year. And based on that, we'd be out of silver by mid-90s. So pick a number, 50, 100, 150. He said up to 200. And if mining supply had stayed static as he asserted or thought in his process, probably would have. Problem was, as soon as he tried on that last book, we really got into heat leaching and we upped the supply dramatically. And so that took the price of silver basically down, as you suggested in what you asked me. So I can never rule that out, that there might be a breakthrough in technology or maybe a substitution. There's really no good substitutes for silver. I mean, yeah, you can substitute platinum, palladium, uh, but they're a lot more expensive, so you're not going to do that. Um, but maybe and graphene costs more in most cases. But uh, there could be. So I always think ahead that, you know, I don't want to make the same mistake that he did. But nonetheless, all things being equal, in theory, we could run out on industrial demand alone. And am I right about hitting peak silver? And the answer is depends. I mean, the USGS just came out with their new survey. They had one. I tried to look it up. I spent a long time trying to find this. I couldn't. I found articles about it, but I could not find the actual USGS printout. Uh, that at one time they said that silver would be the first uh, element on the periodic chart to go extinct. And I typed in something along those lines into one of the main search engines. And there were two or three articles I found that, that quoted that, but I couldn't find it on the USGS website but now but even when they came out with that and it sounds very bullish i said you know the obvious which you just said i mean silver in a silver mine silver is uneconomic at 25 an ounce and there's a lot of those because a lot of these mines can only produce at 25 so it's like mining for free why would you be in a business where you make zero profit but if silver goes to 150 those mines become quite lucrative and so you're going to get more silver above the ground because they become economic. So it's a question, as you already suggested, that depending on the price level, is it economic to mine or not? And the answer is it's the higher the price, the more silver that's just you know, sitting there disseminated and it's not very high grade, 
becomes, you know, worth it, becomes economic. So there's a lot to factor into it. Having said all that, <clears throat> the um, grades keep going down, down, down in the burning ring of fire, and the price just stays the same. In other words, Fresneo, some of these bigger mines, um, and some of the smaller mines. I mean, basically across the board, broad brush, it's not every single mine. So David, you're wrong. It's look at this mine, like IS Silver, a few others. But in most cases, from a broad perspective, the grade keeps going down, not up. So that suggests that it's going to cost more uh, to get it out of the ground because of, you know, cost remaining the same. It's lower grade. You got to push more dirt to get the same amount of ounces. On the other hand, that's not the only problem. Energy costs are going to go up. Labor costs are going to go up. We've got an inflationary bubble uh, that hasn't been extinguished yet, even though we get a lot of rhetoric from the, um, from the Ministry of Truth telling us, don't look over here. Everything is wonderful. The economy's strong. And look at the new averages. They're making a new high. So back to you, Chris. Well, I know what you mean. And obviously, a lot of factors there that we're guessing how they evolve going forward. And I think the demand side has changed, certainly in the 15 years that I've been studying and looking at silver, where, I mean, we had industrial demand before, but certainly with the green agenda has taken a taking things to the a new level within that I've still, I guess what really got me into the silver market in the beginning was thinking about what happened in 2008, 2009, and then seeing that we still have banking issues. And really at the end of the day, the big thing to me is the, the debt, not just on the government, but many governments and, and corporations as well. And, at some point, you have Exeter's Pyramid, and you wonder if that flows through. Obviously, uh, that would be a, a big driver in demand. And it's interesting. We've seen a lot of talk. There is no BRICS gold-backed currency yet. We see signs emerging that certainly they could be heading in that direction. You see the central banks buying gold. And I've been thinking about how we haven't seen perhaps a data point like that for silver yet. Although if you go back five or 10 years and think about gold back then, maybe outside of the gold and silver community, the idea that we're going to be using this as money or a store of value, a little harder to believe. But now we're seeing that on the gold side. And I've wondered, well, just perhaps in the same way that things change over time as events develop, that if central banks or sovereigns are going to gold, mainly because I think there's a growing concern about the treasury as a store of value. I mean, it's not rocket science to look at the supply or look at the yield versus inflation. Do you still expect that at some point that we'll see a similar sentiment carry over to silver as well? Yeah, that's a tough one. And, uh, you know, I've uh, rethought that, you know, several times. So here goes a long winded answer. So, if you look at uh, Professor Jastrom's book, Silver, the Restless Metal, he proves without a shadow of a doubt that nothing does better than silver in an inflationary environment. In a deflationary environment, the, the results are mixed. But that book is you know, decades old. So if we look back at uh, the last, you know, from the 1300s to present day, I put that chart up on my Twitter feed uh, just a week ago or so. I showed the all-time inflation adjusted high for silver. The 1998 dollars was $800 an ounce. And that's an $800 bill of 1998, but still is a constant. And then the gold-silver ratio never got above 20 for thousands of years. Right. Thousands. And why was that? Well, it was because gold and silver were the exact same function. They were money and money alone. And once silver became industrialized and demonetized by the Eastern bankers in the crime of 1873, then silver was persona non grata, even though we had enough of it to use in coinage and all that through 64. So the point is that if silver were a monetary metal and used as such, it would have a much different gold-silver ratio than you have now. 
Now let's flip over to the conspiracy side of things and talk about my crypto conspiracy series where I did 30 interviews. The premise of that is basically from uh, <clears throat> John Perez. And he suggests for your consideration that a lot of the money that went into the cryptocurrencies could have, should have, might have gone into the precious metals. And I think that's a fairly valid argument. So after he made that argument, I did a bit of a deep dive and thought about it. And, well, how do I present this and how do I verify it? And what I discovered is that it could have an effect. I mean, you know, buying a house instead of buying metals has an effect. But we just focus on Bitcoin. Bitcoin at the time was about one-tenth of the gold market. So if all that money that was in Bitcoin went into gold, would it have an effect? Yeah, good. But it's 80 times more powerful on the silver side. And what's interesting is most of the people in the early days of Bitcoin were your silver people because they are the ones that will take the highest risk, take the highest risk to reward profile. So yeah, it might have a nominal effect on gold, but it have 80 times the power in silver. So certainly some of that money that might've gone into precious metals and uh, gone into silver, it would have had, it could have had uh, a noticeable effect. Is that something that was contrived in somebody in a smoke-filled room said, hey, let's get uh, crypto going and take money away from silver? I highly doubt it. I'm not that big a conspiracy theorist. However, it is an interesting thought study uh, about, hmm, I wonder if, you know, and then there's the flip side of that coin, which means there are gold and silver backed cryptos, which makes it um, even better, I think, in some ways than the old days where we actually transferred coins because you could have it on your phone now, and I just like a Bitcoin and you can transfer it, you know, peer to peer or peer to business or whatever pretty easily to the grain or gram which means you don't have to worry too much about exact change or any of that stuff. So there may be a resurgence of silver as money that not too many people think about from the aspect that you can put it on your phone. You can go from mine to mobile, put it on your mobile phone and transact and put yourself on the silver standard again. So lots of things in our future, lots of things to be excited about and lots of dynamics. You know, it depends on the price, depends on supply and demand, depends on, is there going to be a monetary aspect of silver again? Um, and it depends primarily on the mindset. And people like you have done a great deal to educate people. And it doesn't take a lot of new money coming in the silver market because it is so small that will carry it. And once we get up in the 30 range, we get above that, and that becomes support level, uh, we could get back up into the nominal 50 range fairly quickly because there's not a lot of overhead resistance above the 30, 32 level. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. And perhaps countering my earlier question, I mean, on the other hand, you could look at it as that the gold industry has smaller, much smaller industrial demand, almost negligible, I guess you could say, versus silver where most of it's being consumed. But gold in a much higher dollar sized market has still been rising. So you could say that if silver gets that treatment, then uh, perhaps that could change things. And and it's interesting, if you take 10% of the US population and they even bought 100 ounces each, that's another 3.3 billion ounces of silver, which I don't know if 10% of the population is gonna do that. Maybe some of them would buy a lot more than 100 ounces, but certainly like you said, in the environment where we are now, and I guess that's one of the things that stays in the back of my mind is that the Fed balance sheet and the debt load keep getting bigger, maybe temporary reduction in Fed balance sheet yet. And along the lines with what you said with the cryptos, here's a question for you. If if someone was holding a decent amount of cryptos, let's say some guy had a million dollars worth of Bitcoin back when it's three bucks or uh 3,000 rather. And, you know, they've seen it go up to 20 back down. They've seen it go up to 60 back down to 20, then up to. So if you're going from 3 million to 15 or 20 million coming back down. And now I know most of the hardcore Bitcoin proponents are very steadfast yet. 
Gee, I would think, especially if you have a good chunk of money and you've seen those swings, even if you fully believe that it's going higher and going to be a central part of the world going forward, you're still a human. And you would think, you know, at up at 63, you might consider diversifying some of that. No? Yeah, no, it swings both ways. And that's a great point. And I do think that it will happen. Uh, you know, it might be gold primarily, but certainly someone moving into the silver market is so undervalued. In fact, I remember being in a resource conference at the RIC, you know, Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, mm -hmm. early days in the early 2000s. I forget which year. I'll just say 2004 thereabouts. And the gold silver ratio is about 80 to 1 at the time. And I told all the gold bugs in the audience, you know, if you really want to get a killing on gold, buy silver right now at 80 to 1. And when the ratio goes back down to 40 to 1, swap your silver into gold, you get twice as much gold. And that did happen. Um, and that's kind of the similar situation here. If you take your Bitcoin at whatever, 67,000 and swap, you know, half of it into silver at 25 and watch silver go to, you know, 50. And what if Bitcoin doesn't go much above 70,000 for a while? In fact, I just have to interject. I'm gonna. I'm wanting to do probably the last, maybe the final chapter to uh, <clears throat> the crypto conspiracy. I mean, I finished that off probably over a year ago, but I really dive deep, deeper than ever into the whole equation of Bitcoin. And um, there are some things that really concern me. I'm gonna put that on, but I don't want to divert from our conversation. But uh, I get it out. I'll certainly make you aware. And I'll let my audience know as well any teasers or highlights you well yeah you it's, it has to do with an exponential function and uh as chris martinson has pointed out in some of his lectures uh one of the big fallacies of the human race is the inability to understand an exponential function and that's a, what we commonly refer to as the a parabolic move or the hockey stick or those kind of thing if you look at any stock chart commodity chart and you see something going vertical, it does not let sustain itself for very long. It can, and it could Nivea or whatever it is. I mean, that thing's going straight up, but it won't go straight up forever. And as they say, no tree grows to the moon. So, uh, you know, the same thing happened in 1980 with the hunts. I mean, you know, it went from, you know, 15 all the way to 50 in a matter of a few weeks. I mean, it wasn't like it took a long time to get there. Once these big, parabolic moves take place. And the thing to understand is that the exponential function is just that, you know, it's the old game thing about, well, will you take this much for your labor? Or will you give me, you know, one penny on the first square of a checkerboard, two on the next, four on the next data? Oh, yeah, I'll do the checkerboard. Sounds like you're never going to get anywhere. But once you start getting into the middle of the board, and you double, that's called, you know, compounding or an exponential function. And that's only exponential to the two, you know, exponential three, four or five. It's, it's far more powerful. Bitcoin is a two. It's an exponential function of, of two. But nonetheless, I don't think it can be sustained. So there's your teaser. Well, there was a great series that you did with John Perez. It's, it's been a little while since I talked to him, although he's a entertaining character. He knows knows a lot about the markets, too. So We'll keep an eye out for that. And David, perhaps in wrapping up, you can just let people know where they can stay posted with what you're doing and also how they'll be able to find out when that series comes out and anything else you'd like to share. Well, thank you. And I just want to circle back to what you said just before my last comment about, you know, how precious the precious metal is. So I looked it up before the show and I said, well, what, you know, how much silver was carried by the average U.S. citizen back in 1900 okay and the average wage back there was about two dollars and 40 cents a day so i'm just going to say that the average person had a day's worth of wages on it. because remember if you didn't have silver you had no money silver was the money that's all it was money so 240 a dollar as most of us really know and not you know people that don't study that hard a dollar is 0.77 ounces is not an ounce even though the treasury doesn't know that and they stamp one dollar on a one ounce coin, it's it's wrong. A dollar is a weight and it's not an ounce. But anyway, so if you go to two dollars and forty cents, that's 0.75, I'll round it down. That's an ounce and a half plus 40 cents. 
So an ounce and a half plus four, I'm going to call it two ounces. So two ounces of silver back in 1900 was what the average person had on them, maybe more, maybe less. And now there's what, 330 million Americans? Mm -hmm. If they all had that <clears throat> two ounces, we'd be at 660 million ounces. And that's more than is available on any given year because the total silver supply is 1 billion ounces. Right. That's 850 out of mining and 150 million of recycling. 60% of that market is gone in the industry. So you got to take that and you have about 400 million ounces left. Well, you got about 20% or so, depends on the year, say 10 in jewelry. So now you're down to maybe 300 million ounces. And just every American had what they had in 1900 in silver today, which isn't a whole lot. I mean, two ounces of silver is what, 50 bucks? It's not going to make or break your day. I mean, if you have 50 bucks in silver, unless you buy a lottery ticket, it is not going to change your financial status. <laughs> and yet we couldn't do that. There's not enough silver available to really do that on an annual basis. And even on a uh, above ground basis, um, it's always debatable how much there is. But let's just say there's uh, equal to gold, five or six billion ounces. Even there, it'd only be a few years. Apart. So back to you. Thank you. Two things I'll mention. My website, thewellnessreport.com. Get on there. At the top of it, the landing page, there's icons for our Facebook group, our LinkedIn, our Twitter, and our YouTube channel. And if you're interested, Interested in the documentary I'm doing about the stress and becoming free of this debt-based monetary system. I'm doing a documentary called silversunrise.tv. So go to silversunrise.tv, take a look at that. And if you're um, encouraged by what I'm doing and want to join a revolution to uh, put the power of money back into people's hands, please join in. Well, that sounds exciting to hear, and I will look forward to checking that one out. And there's silversunrise.tv. And David, just uh, thank you for joining me here today and laying some insight out there for people as we see. It's weird. On one hand, I would say an exciting time in the gold and silver market, yet it feels like most people still feel pretty beaten up in gold and silver, but um, things happening and appreciate everything that you've done in studying and teaching others about the silver market and I'm actually listening to the silver manifesto audiobook right now so I've been enjoying oh. that one again and uh you just take good care of yourself i know people always appreciate hearing from you and we'll catch up and do this again sometime soon well thank you chris appreciate the time well thank you david sure was nice to catch up with him as always obviously someone who has been studying and analyzing the silver market for quite a long time and someone that I know people enjoy hearing from, one of my great teachers on this journey. So hope you found that helpful at home. And before we wrap up, I did want to thank Silver Viper Minerals who brought us today's show. And Silver Viper, as you may know, has its La Virginia Gold Silver Project where they had their discovery at El Ruby, which has been the basis of a 49 million ounce silver equivalent resource estimate as they have found high-grade gold and silver throughout El Ruby, and they're still on track to be releasing an updated resource estimate, and also looking forward to going out drilling again, hopefully sometime later this year, to further define what they have there, as well as to test some of the new targets that they have uncovered during their mapping and sampling plans. So, you can find out more about Silver Viper at silverviperminerals.com. And certainly if we are on the verge of a silver rally, a company to take a look at and find out more about, we'll be having Steve Cope of Silver Viper back on the show probably next week. So hear more about it from him. But in either case, thank you to Silver Viper and thank you to David and everyone watching at home. Hope you enjoyed today's show and we will see you again soon.